address to the August Assembly. Uh, Savika is a non-political group of uh, uh, Gulf uh, region uh, Ambedkarites, NRIs, basically. And we foster, we endeavor our our uh, payback to society theme in the way of organizing such events. Uh, we contribute monetarily to some NGOs who are running the uh, educational institutes for our underprivileged uh, students. We encourage our uh, uh, thoughts of our Mahanaika and Mahanaiks to our masses. And we try to uh, network uh, our international Ambedkarite movements all over the globe through some symposiums and some organizations visiting different countries. So that's a, a salient uh, two, three points I want to mention about the Savika. Now coming to the main uh, agenda of this program, Baba Sahib has given us the uh, formula of education, organize and educate. So education was the first prime importance Baba Sahib has given. And that's how last, I think, uh, this is the consecutive uh, fourth year uh, we have uh, Suraj with us and we are continuing this program last four years. So this is the fourth year. Two years continuously we conducted program in uh, Uruvela Colony Hall and this is the second uh, program in this hall. So this is the fourth consecutive program and this shows the dedication of uh, uh, Suraj towards the uh, society and in particular towards the young generation like this hall you can you can see the example. Suraj, this young generation is looking at you as an icon. And they take the inspiration. And the very objective of this program was to inject the energy and the inspiration to these masses who are underprivileged, who are not getting the proper guidance. For my example, I would like to quote, when I came from village, I didn't know where to go whether I should take BA, Commerce or Science. I didn't know even the science, what is science, what is commerce, what is art. One of my relatives, he put me in the science team and that's how I became, a, became an engineer. Otherwise, I could have been the art or uh, commerce graduate. Now, doesn't matter either it is science, art or commerce, but as an Indian society, we have given too much weightage to the science and medical engineers and medicals, but that's not the truth. You have the examples. Suraj is not a science graduate. Suraj is not an engineer. Suraj is not a doctor, uh, Miss MBBS. He's a doctor. Anurag is another example. Kanishka is another example. Dr. Praveen, he's also a different stream. He's a doctor too, but he's from veterinary background and he turn it to be uh, social and civil services uh, cadre. So, come out of that uh, very uh, social stigma of that making your son or pupil as an engineer or doctor. Come out of that dilemma, first of all. There are plenty of streams available across the globe and they will share their uh, life uh, uh, and experience how they have reached to that stage. Now, I am confident that the audiences are very much excited to take this energy and inspiration. So without taking much time, I would spare this time for our distinguished uh, speakers. And once upon, I will welcome all of you to this uh, special and rarest of the rare uh, event where we have 
four of Harvard Ambedkarites at one stage convening you guys. So please welcome all the four guest speakers and I, on behalf of all the organizing committees, I take this opportunity once again. Thank you. We have one more organizer from Sri Shant Gadge Baba Seva Sastan, Mr. Chandrasekhar Bambole. I request you, sir, to say a few words on this occasion. I would like to share only two minutes. Dr. Baba Seva Medkar said, Consistency is the virtue of an ass. Every responsible person must learn to unlearn what he has learned. A responsible person must have courage to rethink over the thinking. And there can be no any finality. If you stand for something, you will always find some people for you and some against you. But if you stand for nothing, you will always find nobody for you, nobody against you. You must have courage to rethink over the thinking, what I have said just very shortly. One thing I would like to say here, this program has not been organized here, but also at Brahmapuri. These all the organizers wanted the marginalized community student to know all the information which are going to got here by these all the dignitaries. The same information will be got at Brahmapuri. थोड़ा सा मराठी में तो बोलते हैं। अपने नागपुर भागातील, ब्रह्मगिरी भागातील, ग्रामीण भागातील, विद्यार्थना एक फैड लग ले ला है, बीएमएस, एमबीबीएस, डॉक्टर, इंजीनियरिंग। परंतु अपने भाग में तो बीए जाले ला, बीकाम जाले ला, एमकाम जाले ला। आणि त्याला पुढे नौकरी लागली नाही तर तो निराश होतो आणि निराश झाल्यानंतर तो मग विचार करायला लागतो की आपल्याला कुठलं तरी एखादं लेबरचं काम करायला आवडेल आणि तो त्या पद्धतीनं विचार करतो आणि तो काम सुद्धा करायला लागतो आत्ताच या ठिकाणी विजय बागडे साहेबांनी सांगितल्याप्रमाणे अशा कुठल्याही इंजिनिअरिंग आणि मेडिकल सोडून दुसऱ्या अकॅडेमिक फॅकल्टीमधूनही आलेल्या विद्यार्थ्यांना उच्च शिक्षण आणि त्याचं करिअर विदेशामध्ये करता येत आहे आणि म्हणून या भारतामधूनच गेलेली आपल्यासारखी सामान्य कुटुंबातून ती जगलेली एव्हान आपल्यापेक्षा ज्यांच्याकडे पैशाची इतकी चंचन भासायची तरीसुद्धा अशा परिस्थितीला न जुमानता त्यांनी हार्वर्डसारख्या विद्यापीठामध्ये जाऊन त्या ठिकाणी स्वतःचं करिअर नुसतं बनवलंच नाही तर त्या ठिकाणी उच्च शिक्षण घेऊन करिअरसोबत त्या ठिकाणी उच्च पदावरती काम करत आहेत त्यांना त्या ठिकाणी आलेला तो अनुभव या भारतामधून जाताना जाता जाता त्यांना होणाऱ्या झालेल्या यातना त्यांनी केलेलं ते कष्ट आणि तिथे त्यांनी केलेल्या कष्टानंतर त्या कष्टाचं जे त्यांना जे फळ मिळालं आणि त्याचा तो अनुभव या ठिकाणी आपल्या सर्वांच्या समोर ते शेअर करणार आहेत हा अनुभव तुम्हाला तुमचं जीवन जगण्यासाठी तुमचं करिअर घडवण्यासाठी तो फार लाभदायक होईल एवढंच बोलतो या संपूर्ण मार्गदर्शनाचा आपण उत्तमपणे चांगला लाभ घ्यावा एवढं बोलतो इथेच थांबतो जय भेट स्ट्रॉंगली अपील अँड रिक्वेस्ट टू अवर ऑनरेबल गेस्ट मिस्टर अनुराग भास्कर सर टू शेअर हिज थॉट इट्स अ व्हेरी स्पेशल डे फॉर मी अँड इट्स एन ऑनर फॉर मी टू कम हेअर अँड टू टॉक टू यू टू 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 टॉक टू ऑल ऑफ यू आय एम अ लॉयर नाव हॅव्हिंग अ प्रोग्रॅट फ्रॉम आवर्ड सो माय डिसिजन टू डू लॉ बेसिकली केम after being inspired by dr ambedkar in my school days his image of being the chief architect of the indian constitution used to attract me a lot so i thought of studying law so that i could also contribute as an agent of social change but like dr ambedkar had also gone to columbia and later to london school of economics 
So eventually in my fourth year of the law school, I thought that I should also apply abroad. But it almo I almost thought it impossible that I could get into Harvard. But I think it did not happen of a sudden. It took almost two, three years of efforts to finally get into Harvard. So this was my reason why I applied for Harvard. I would like to tell you how Harvard is different from Indian law schools. In Harvard, I feel that you get to have a lot of great professors. For me, the most interesting thing was being taught by those professors who have also taught Barack Obama in 1990s. So I had two such professors at the law school. And I would often be interested in going to the chambers just to talk about how Obama was when he was a law student at Harvard Law School. So some of the professors, like a professor told me that Barack Obama al always knew that he had to do something to change the lives of his people. So he was always clear in, in his mind that after law school, after completing his education from law school, he would work in society. One, another professor told me that Barack Obama, like many of us, was like many of us are, like even I was like hesitant in class. He never spoke much. But whenever he spoke, he spoke with such conviction that everyone would listen to him. So it's, it was a great privilege for me to be taught by those professors. Other professors have also been great. And they taught me to read law in a different perspective. Like in Indian law schools, we are taught to read constitutional law just by reading the text of the Constitution or by judgment. But in US, I learned how history, social movements, political movements have sh shaped in the values of the Constitution. Like for instance, in unlike India, in India, we were given equal voting rights from the Constitution. But in US, the Africans, Americans had to struggle for centuries even to get the basic voting rights. So I feel like right now from those professors, I feel I, I'm more committed to the values which are in our constitution and which we should never take those values for granted. The second thing about Harvard is that you learn from a global perspective. Like my LLM class comprised of 180 students who came from 65 different countries. So these 180 students would be judges in their countries or bureaucrats like Praveen sir or of the former district magistrate of Chandrapur, where we are going tomorrow, Ashutosh Shalil was my classmate at Harvard, or Sheila Shell, who is a police commissioner based in Mumbai from Maharashtra only. She was also studying with me. So even in Indian crowd, like you study with such a diverse crowd from young people to such experienced people. So not only from attending classes of great professors, but also spending time with these great individuals who are working, doing great works in their respective countries. You get to learn a lot just by interacting with them. The other thing about Harvard is, is that you get to meet a lot of people there. I mean, a lot of famous people who are doing a great work in their fields. For me, I or like I, rem I would always remember meeting two people in United States whose works I've always followed. I would um, acknowledge Professor Michael Sandel, who is at Harvard, whose lectures initially attracted my attention for studying at Harvard. And I also fondly remember meeting the former governor of RBI, Dr. Aguram Rajan, and getting time to interact with him. So you get all those opportunities if you go to these top institutions, which you don't easily get in Indian institutions. Apart from that, in Harvard, you get to meet people in working in different fields. Like, not like an individual can enroll not only just like I was at the Harvard Law School, but I could attend classes at the Harvard Kennedy School, like the School of Public Policy or the Divinity School. So I met Suresh because he was at the Kennedy School, or Kanishka because he was at the School of Arts and Sciences. So be, being um, to Ivy League institutions, I feel that it transforms you suddenly. Like I would honestly tell you that if you would be meeting me one year before, I wouldn't have the confidence of coming here and standing here to tell about my story to you. 
So I feel like when you go to these institutions, you meet new people, you meet great people, you yourself change your personality. A resident of Telangana, Kanishka sir is pursuing his PhD at Department of Anthropology. Kanishka sir is a PhD candidate in Anthropology at Harvard University. His research is on, th is on themes of economic development, middle classes, and castes in India. Prior to this, he worked as an analyst at a private company in Delhi where his focus was on research on the energy sector in India. But it's, uh, I mean, I'm really glad to be here. It's, I'm really happy to see so many people. And it also kind of helps me because otherwise I'll have to like talk to each of you individually. Now I can like talk to so many people at once. Uh, so basically, I was just talking to some students yesterday, and I, there was something came up which I thought might be the first point that I should make about applying to Harvard or you know anywhere. So one of the biggest issues that I think that people have, especially uh, in marginalized sections, Dalit community, or any other form of disadvantaged marginalized students, is that some of this discrimination actually becomes internalized. So the example uh, is, uh, for example, when I was in school, I went to a very good school, actually. But because I went to a good school, people didn't want me there. I had to face a, you know, the usual sorts of discrimination. So people would say things like, you know, oh, you people are not suitable for education. You shouldn't even be here. You people should be on the farm, or you should be taking care of buffaloes. So when people keep saying that to you over and over again, what happens after a certain time is you kind of internalize it then they don't have to tell you anymore. They don't have to say you're stupid. You just start thinking I'm stupid. So I've seen that happen to like a lot of my friends. By the time we got to like seventh or eighth grade, a lot of students would joke, like I would say, we have an exam tomorrow, why aren't you reading? And they would say things like, we are not suitable for education, like we shouldn't be here. They say it as a joke, but you know, it kind of becomes real. So I think the first and the biggest thing that I would uh, like to tell you all, I mean, whoever is interested in pursuing anything big, is that go inside and look at that self-doubt and get that out. Go within yourself and find that confidence. Because <clears throat> I mean, so I will tell you a little bit more about my experience at Harvard and that will make some of these things clearer. But no matter what situation you're in, I don't know if you'll go to you know, pursue a PhD or something, but you can do a lot more than you think you're capable of. That much should be obvious to you. If it's not, go within and make it obvious because that's the starting point. Until you kind of believe it yourself, nobody else is going to believe you and you probably won't do anything. You might, but it's exceptionally unlikely. So that's the first piece of advice. And, uh, the second thing is maybe I'll tell you a little bit about, actually, I'm not sure. I, I spoke about my experience of how I went to Harvard before, but it's, I'm a little worried that instead of motivating you, I might actually discourage you because my story is a little, uh, I mean, everything here is unconventional, but mine is a little bit more unconventional. But it let me show you that, uh, what you may have thought of as the usual Harvard PhD candidate may not be true because when, so before I applied, kind of like Anurag's experience, two years before I applied, I had no idea that I would. I just did not think it was possible. In fact, by the time I finished my master's in economics in JNU, I began to think that it's already too late. That, you know, I mean, most of my uh, friends who were pursuing PhDs were, they all, they all had better grades than I did. They already knew their plans. They already had their research ideas. And they were asking for letters of recommendation. I did not even know any professor well enough to ask for a letter of recommendation. So I thought, it's over. This is not going to happen. And yet, a couple of years later, it happened. So. Uh, Maybe, okay, let me just start with my story. So I was working as an energy analyst, as you heard, and uh, 
there is this entrance exam called the GRE that people take in order to you know, go abroad for masters or PhD programs. And I only took that exam because in that year, the GRE changed its pattern and they gave a 50% discount. <laughs> so the first cohort, the first two months of the new exam was at a 50% discount. So I thought, if I'm ever going to take the exam, this is the time because, you know. So that's why I took the exam. And at that point, I had no plans of applying for a PhD. But most JNU students like to say that, you know, I don't want corporate job, you know, I'm, I'm the intellectual type, I want to go to a PhD. So I was also saying that. I, I didn't really mean it, but, you know, I thought this is a nice thing to say because it sounded better. Uh, and so I took my GRE. Uh, the score was all right. I mean, it's, again, I know many people will ask you, what is my score? But I'm not going to tell you because that's not important. <laughs> like, you can go to any website and look at the university websites. They will tell you that you can email them. They'll reply saying that we don't have any minimum score requirements. And that's true. It's actually true. So, and I thought, OK, the GRE is done. Now what? Then I looked at a couple of websites, and I got like, I looked at several courses. I looked at everything from you know, psychology, philosophy, anthropology, economics. Even though I'm a master's in economics, I looked at everything else. Uh, I even looked at communication studies. And then I started asking people, so what should I do now? And they were like, what do you want to do? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> so they said, you know, you figure out what you want to do, and then you know, maybe we can help you. So one of my friends. Uh, said that you should apply for anthropology. I said, what is anthropology? Why will I apply for anthropology? He said, another friend of mine applied for anthropology as in the US doing anthropology. <laughs> I said, so what? I'm an economic student. Why will I apply for <laughs> anthropology? Anyways, he said that. And then when I went home, uh, some of my friends were preparing for the civil services, and they had anthropology material. So I started looking at it. And uh, at that time, I also went to a bookstore, and I bought a couple of books. One of them was called Anthropology. So it's like an introductory book. I took that home, I read it, and then I became a little bit interested in it. So I thought, uh, let's just write a draft application. I thought I'll write one for anthropology, I'll also write one for psychology and communication studies and public policy. But by then I started losing interest in economics because I had already done some work and I was looking at all the research being done by economists. And I was like really bored with it. So I asked myself if I could go to like the best university ever, and if I was not concerned about finding a job, what would I do? And then eventually, I decided anthropology and psychology are good options. So I thought I'll write all these applications and see what happens. But what ended up was happening was that I just wrote my application for anthropology, and then I got tired. I said, this is enough. Now I'll just send this in and see what happens. So I know, I mean, I, I would like to tell you a story about how since childhood I always wanted to be an anthropologist and I was driven and that I wanted to change society and that, you know, that's why I'm in front of you. But that's not true. And I'm, I'm worried that I might actually discourage some of you or that some of you might think this is all nonsense. Anybody can go anywhere, like nothing makes sense anymore. But that, that wouldn't be entirely true either. What I'm trying to tell you is, Look at how random this is, right? I did not know that I would go there. Now a lot of people say, oh, you're a very smart Harvard student. And I tell them, no, I was smart even two years before I joined Harvard. Like, <laughs> going there did not make me smart. <clears throat> so, I mean, now people think that, but do you think I, I've become much smarter the minute I went there? Not really. Nothing really changed. Everything that was there was there inside me, and nobody thought that this guy is capable of anything big. Okay, some people did, but <laughs> nobody thought that I would do a PhD. Nobody thought that I would do a PhD from Harvard. Nobody thought that I would do a PhD in anthropology from Harvard. Even today, my friends, sometimes, you know, I meet my friends from SRCC and JNU, and some of them ask me, what is anthropology? <laughs> Especially, you know, because most of my friends from college, they're MBAs and accountants. Like, they don't know how to spell anthropology, I think. <laughs> so what I'm trying to tell you is this, that no matter what the situation is right now, you probably can do a lot more than you think is possible. 
So if you are like me, like I was several years ago, and you're thinking that, you know, and now it's not possible that, you know, I went off on a different track, or I did this, or that I didn't read that one book three years ago, it doesn't matter. I basically get questions from people every once in a while, like I get emails from random people. They ask me something like, uh, I would like to get into Harvard, please give me some guidance. And usually, so, or sometimes people ask me like, how should I, how, what should I do to go to Harvard? And that's usually a bad question. Because the answer, correct answer would be something like, you know, take a plane, go to Boston. <laughs> because it's, it's that vague, like, why would you want to go to Harvard? You first have to know why. Like, what will you do there? Do you want to like do a master's, an undergraduate, a PhD? Do you want to just like sweep the floors? Like, what is the point? <laughs> so, which I'm coming back to, you know, my initial point that you should know what you want, firstly. And like I said, I did not know what I want for the most part, but I've realized that you can start to do really powerful things when you know and when you're really aligned with, you know, what you believe. So let's say one of you came up to me and said, you want to go to Harvard, I'd ask you why. And usually you might say something like, because it's a very good university. Yeah, that's a very good university, but why should you go there? Because then, you know, what is it, high status? And so what? Usually you should have a reason and the reason should be a strong one. And once you have a strong reason, you'll find the motivation to do things. Again, actually, I'm not the best person to talk about like success and all that because, you know, I'm still a student, all right? Even though I'm going to Harvard, it's, I'm still a student. And there are people here who have achieved more. <laughs> but since I get this question a lot, I thought I'll deal with it at least a little bit. So ask yourself, what is your reason? What do you want to do and why do you want to do it? Like take a paper and write that down. Because this will eventually become a part of what you call your statement of purpose. Because that's what the university is asking you anyways. The university wants to know why do you want to go there? What do you want to do? And how will it help you? And what will you do with it in the end? Bombe
His Holiness uh, Bhante Suresh Sasai has specially come on our uh, uh, request uh, uh, for this program. So we really are grateful and we are blessed to have his blessings. And I'm sure uh, all of you, the students and their parents are uh, inspired by his uh, blessings. Thank you. We shall move on with our program. So uh, we have our next guest coming up uh, for the addressing the conference. Thank you. Successful span of 22 years in uniform services before voluntarily taking change of Telangana Social Welfare Residential Educational Institute Society. Such a dramatic change, and he's extremely successful. So uh, let us hear from Sir. This is my uh, third visit to this holy place. I feel extremely honored and uh, privileged to be in your midst. And I thank all the parents who brought their children here. Uh, today is a holiday, I guess. So, but uh, despite uh, so many soap operas, serials, movies, temptations to go to malls, you took a, you made a very conscious choice to bring your children here. Thank you very much. A big jai beam to you for the parents and for all the youth. The reason why I say this, because I wanted to become a truck driver when I was a child. Although I was a son of two teachers, I wanted to become a truck driver. Because my, I was born and brought up in a uh, very interior village in uh, the Andhra Pradesh, now it is Telangana, so Mahabub Nagar, Nalamala, a reserve forest where only you see tigers and then all other animals. So I was born in those places and then the people who used to work, people who used to live in our colonies were only the agricultural laborers, then, then stone cutters and then truck drivers. As usual, all the boys will have uh, passion and obsession for wheels. So I wanted to become a truck driver. When my mom asked me, what do you want to become? I said, truck driver. She gave me a big slap. <laughs> she gave me a slap for a reason. I thank her for that. She is uh, surviving. She is uh, 77 years old. And uh, she refused to stay with me. And she stays uh, in her village, in our village, because she was a bonded laborer. She was a bonded laborer, and uh, she was rescued by two teachers. And uh, those teachers, why did they come to our home? This is very important. In 1950s, thanks to Baba Sahib, in 1950s, when uh, scheduled caste people, for the first time, they you know, got the access to letters and education, these two people could become teachers. And when they came to school, and when they wanted to settle in that village to hire a home, uh, but take a house on rent, and the village landlord, they said, you guys are yes, scheduled caste. You can't stay in our you know, village. So these people cannot leave their jobs. And then, because that is the only source of livelihood. So they came to scheduled caste colony. And then they asked my grandfather. My grandfather was, again, a laborer, but very smart man. So he said, OK, hamara paas ek jopad hai. if you want to stay in this jopad, uh, that's OK. When uh, they started staying in our jopad, and then they saw my mom taking a sickle and then going for mazduri laborer. So then they convinced my grandparents and then took my mom uh, to school. And then she finished her uh, seventh grade. And then from then 10th grade in government school, after with a lot of discrimination, let me tell you, my mom, when she tells her story, my blood boils. And I'm a police officer. So, <laughs> so, and I have one AK-47 also. <laughs> so, my mom, uh, uh, my mom, uh, you know, she faced a lot of discrimination. And then she went on to become uh, a school topper in uh, 10th grade. And then she became a teacher. Then uh, she married my father, another uh, dropout from uh, the schools. But she was res he was rescued by another teacher. So and then today, my mom, I, I'll, I'll, I'll press a fast forward button now. So today, my mom is a proud mother of uh, an IPS officer, a doctor, very successful doctor, <laughs> and uh, an associate professor. And uh, she's a, nowadays, she's a proud mother-in-law of one MLA also. <laughs> so I thought, 
when an agricultural laborer could become a mother of an IPS officer, I think that story must resonate in every place and then that must be replicated in every part of this country. That is very important. So, but when you are in university, you are not, you are surrounded, if you are surrounded by people with uh, bad habits, then time wasters and the people who procrastinators, then you are, you, are, you are heading for a doom. So, your company decides your destiny. That's very important. So, then after Indian Railway Traffic Service, then three of us, we got together and then we really worked very hard, 16 hours a day. Then my roommate got All India fifth rank in IAS. And we studied in, we did not study in a private guest accommodation, we studied in a car shed because there was no accommodation in Andhra Pradesh study circle in those days. They gave us a car shed. We only requested them to give us a toilet. So car shed, then I became an IPS officer, that guy became an IAS officer, another guy became a senior scientist. So from there our journey went on. So now I'll come to Harvard. So I done, for about 14, uh, 15 uh, years, or 16 years, I did I did best of my postings. And I, I worked in uh, Adilabad, which shares border with Maharashtra. Then I worked in Karimnagar, which again shares border with Gadchiroli. Then I worked in Warangal. Then I worked in Anantapur. I got the best possible medals any police officer in this country can hope for. OK. So but I was not satisfied. I was absolutely not satisfied. The guilt, like uh, one sister just now told in her inaugural remarks, on March 18th, 1956, Baba Sahib literally had tears in his eyes. Because all these people, they took advantage of, them, advantage of my vision, and then these people are only revolving around their families. They are revolving around their promotions. They are revolving around their uh, increments, but not the community. Then why did I think about these people? That's the that's the you know regret Baba Sahib had. So we didn't want to follow that path. So we we didn't want to follow that. The guilt of not being able to do anything for my community was really becoming very very heavy. One day my mother called me. So my mother called me. He said, uh, you know, whenever you come, you come, you stay only for one hour or two hours, three hours in the name of security. Go back. So, but you have to stay for about five to six hours in the village. Then I stayed back. Then she showed me each and every home. And then all of them are stone cutters. Somebody PPK Margaya, somebody Abibi Mazduri Kara, some girl is getting married at a very young age. Then my mom asked me a very simple question. Should I feel proud that my son is an IP IPS officer or should I feel ashamed that uh, in spite of being an IPS officer, all his neighbors are living in abject poverty? That was a question. That really opened up my eyes, my dear friends. I'm telling you very honestly. So that is what has happened. So then Nagpur is directly responsible for my getting into Harvard. Uh, Ravindra Bangar is a very good friend of mine. So one day he came to my office. And then I said, uh, sir, you must go to like uh, Hemant. So he is also a very active guy. His sole purpose of service is, okay, serve the country, but serve the community as well. He says, serving the community is nothing but serving the country. That is Ravindra Bangar said. He came to my office, sir. I don't know who you are, but I saw your profile. I saw your good work. Everybody is talking like this. You are DCP crime. You are superintendent of police, etc., etc. But you must go to Harvard. My brother Ravindra, chodo. Kon diya mera address apko. So then finally he said, no. Then he doesn't know me. He said, sir, aap jana hi chahiye. Then he came to my home. Without telling anything, came to my home. Then he spoke to my wife, my Babaji, kaise bhi karke isko Harvard bez dijega. So, aapko koi chinta na rehna chahiye. All of you will go to Harvard or some other great university. Don't worry about that. Then I came back. So, I came back and then I straight walked into the chamber of chief minister after taking his appointment. I said, sir, I am the product of social welfare. I have two minute time. I am the product of social welfare hostels. Please give me an opportunity to serve these departments so that uh, I can do much better job to those people who are denied opportunities. Scheduled cause, scheduled tribes, poor OBCs, etc. 
Then first he got uh, Honorable Chief Minister in those days got confused. Are koi IAS officer, IPS officer, ye social welfare department ko jana hi nahi chata. Tum pagal ho gaya. Harvard se aaya desktop job bol raha. Even people who from, from SC community also they don't want to go to social welfare department. Why is that you are asking a social welfare department? Then I said, no sir, mera dimaag mein kida hai. Abhi usko nikalna mud mushkil hai. <laughs> then he said, okay, jao. So he yeah, gave me the order. Very first day, there was a massive strike. Strike is liye. This is a notorious IPS officer. He has one AK-47, he has one pistol. Our children, when will they study? Then our teachers, they will kill all our teachers in the name of punctuality. Are punctuality to high in the name of discipline. So anyway, I convinced them finally. This is my eighth year, friends. This is my eighth year. First thing I did was, in my office there was no Baba Sai's photograph. First thing I did was, both but isse bada Baba Sai photograph, I put in my office. Because when in 1979, when my mom came to my hostel and then gave me one rupee pocket money, I used to cry. One rupee se kya hota hai? So then my mom used to say, I have so many brothers to feed and then I have three more children to feed, so tum akela nahi hai. So I used to cry. But today, I am able to sign the checks worth 59 crores every month. Who gave me this power? Baba Sahib. Who gave me this power? Baba Sahib. So the person, the visionary who is responsible for my position, how can I ignore him? So I said, do a photo of the Baba Sahib. Ka laga do. If you come to my chamber, you will see. Bahut se log, bahut se log wo photo dekhne ke liye aate. <laughs> you came, right? <laughs> it's a very good photograph. Okay. So that is what I did. So then second thing what I did was he made a very important mention, uh, Mr. Kanishka. What he said was, we internalize the symbols that thrown upon us. The second edition, we took in our schools, we have about 2 lakh children, we took in our schools is to discourage usage of Dalit. We don't use a word called Dalit in our schools. Because, this is a very controversial statement, please forgive me if I am saying wrong. What do you mean by Dalit? It is broken. How, is Suraj Jangde broken? Is Kanishka broken? Is uh, Basket broken? They spoke very good language. Many people cannot, the jo, um, billions ma, um, you know, kamara hai, they will not be able to speak like him. How can you call these people as broken? Pichde, Nimna, Achut, kaise ho sakta? I said, no, we will not use. Our children, hamara maabab ka to ho gaya, bejti, bagar hamara children, they will not enter into this world with those symbols, negative symbols. They will enter into this world with positive symbols. Suraj, Suraj Engde, Suraj Engde, postdoctoral fellow, IARA, I'll tell you the long form, again from the same school where Pravin sir had gone, Howard Kennedy School. Suraj Engde is an award-winning scholar and an activist from India. Suraj is an author of bestseller, Caste Matters, which was unveiled today. <coughs> I am so happy I keep coming here. Um, and I think it's because of uh, Nagpur Kars I have to come here. Uh, they are very, very devoted, as well as they are very, very committed. And also, they are sometimes forceful. Uh, they also emotionally blackmail you for you to come. <laughs> so all that culminates into me coming here. Um, I think the vision they have and their team have is something that has to uh, do with the vision of Baba Sahib and which is to work with our, uh, with our education as, as a field. And so uh, uh, and this kind of club together, and, and we all got together. And so the idea of Harvard Ambedkarites was floated when uh, Kanishka, me, Anurag, Mani, Sujata were at Harvard at the same time. And it was like the first time. There were so many Ambedkarites at the same place in a very elite institutions coming from this amazing background. And, and still holding strong and, and going strong. And so we started having initial meetings, we started having initial conversations, uh, and, and we discussed various issues. Uh, more importantly, it was to 
uh, what can we do? Well, we are educated, we are at Harvard, what can we do uh, since now we are here uh, in the sense of paying back to our society? Because this is the right time for us to paying back to society because we are already here. And if we are already here, people will uh, have more personal label uh, 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 relation because uh, you are a Harvard person, and so they will look at you in a in, in a very sensible light. <clears throat> and so that's how we started, and then we kind of got together and made an informal group where we made an announcement that we want to, uh, uh, in in the in the years to come, in ten years to come, uh, we will at least put across. Uh, 100 uh, PhD students through Ivy League schools. And I think <clears throat> that was the aim. And then, you know, basic information that they give you is what we do not have. The rest we have. Uh, we can work hard. Uh, we are very devoted. We have uh, Baba Sahib Ambedkar National Students Federation. Uh, it's very important that we, as students, you know, we don't have any organization on a national level. We are desperately lacking on that because of that, our most important resource. For our community, the most valuable, the most prized position is education. And the most valued group amongst us are our students because they are our futures. We have heavily invested in them and we continue to do so. But we don't have a, a, a cogent program to unite our students and they undergo um, atrocious experiences uh, since they enter colleges and they are not prepared well enough. And I think this is about time in organizations like BANSF and others, and especially us, uh, the, the, the adults, so-called adults or people mature, that they inject the confidence in them. A person cannot go any far if he or she is not proud of who he or she is. Until unless you, have pr you are proud of who you are, your ancestors, your history, your struggle, and your day-to-day -day survival tactics, if you do not acknowledge this as part of your being, you are merely a skeleton without a soul walking on the streets. We want you to be proud. We want you to be aggressively proud because you are here out of the, because there are many sacrifices done on your behalf. If I am here, my community has sacrificed for me directly, or indirectly. And that's why we owe a huge debt to our community. The people, the students who are going to colleges and schools, it is not only because of your parents that you're going to school, it is because of your community sacrifices that you're reaping the benefits of your school. Somewhere, sometime, there was someone in your community on the streets, in the parliament, in the bureaucracy, in the schools, fighting for your rights. Because when we fight, we fight for all of our rights. We don't fight for individual rights. And that's the beauty of being an Ambedkarite. We have amazing, uh, uh, these are the pioneers, ladies and gentlemen, that I am presenting to you. R.S. Praveen, one of the first bureaucrats to crack the Mason MP, a highly competitive mid-career program at Harvard Kennedy School, getting through it and getting scholarships from both government and as well as Harvard. And after that, creating a tradition that almost every year there is at least one scheduled caste bureaucrat in the program getting admitted ever since he went to the school. <laughs> and it continues to happen. Even now, we have one of us uh, in the Harvard Kennedy School who I'm going to very shortly meet. Anurag Bhaskar. Anurag Bhaskar is probably the first, the first amongst us to graduate from the prestigious Harvard Law School. No one, no one that we know of comes from the community and who has gone to the best of the best schools where the elites have gone and still retain and still be and still retain his pride about his community and whenever he went and wherever he talked he made sure that his community was his center of focus and that's why when he dedicated his thesis to the memories of Rohit Vemula as well as to the struggle of Payal Tadvi it is here we see the new Ambedkarites that are brimming amongst us. The third pioneer Kanishka Elopula we have heard his story a person from our community to get into Harvard PhD program. In two years time, he will be a Harvard PhD. 
That's a powerful symbol. That's a powerful cultural capital. The people who went to Harvard and had PhDs in economics are the people who are destroying the country. Kanish Kelopula will unite the country. He is a source of inspiration to all of you, including me. Coming from the odds that all of you have come from. We are part of you as much as you are part of us. I am an extension of you. So let there be no barrier. Let there be no hurdle to think that he or she is an extraordinary. We are still part of you. And therefore, you have to be like us and more than us. The reason we decided to have this conversation and have this uh, personable uh, interaction with you is to tell you that you rightly deserve more than what you have right now. And with their testimonies and their stories, you can see they were not satisfied with what they were given. They always wanted more because they knew they had responsibilities. Responsibilities that go and surpass beyond family, children, and immediate internal circle boundaries. They had responsibilities of a community that they are so proud of being part of that. And therefore, this is an opportunity for all of you. And Nagpur has this incredible privilege to host and to witness first ever Harvard Ambedkarites Convention and with the participants, with the star speakers coming to you directly. We had uh, many pioneering events, uh, one of them very famous, uh, All India uh, Depressed Class Women's Conference that was conducted in Nagpur. Then, of course, we had Baba Saheb Ambedkar converting in this very uh, space, uh, giving us a new identity, a new life, removing us from the fiefdom and the slavery that the Hindu Brahminic system had given us and gave us a new life, ushered a new confidence amongst us by making us Buddhists. And now the tradition continues. I would like to acknowledge um, the incredible volunteers who are dressed in the purple. They have really put in their efforts and you can see in the way you're organized and you're sitting. Let's give it up to the volunteers who have put up their efforts. Let us also acknowledge the, uh, the beautiful uh, women around here uh, who have been very graciously, uh, patiently being, the, as uh, Captain Bamboli called them, the cabin crew. Uh, I, 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 I call them uh, the, the uh, soulful butterflies of this audience. <laughs> I would also like to acknowledge uh, Dalit Dastak Ashok Das has come all the way from New Delhi uh, to, to cover this event. Uh, Lord Buddha TV, as well as Awaz India TV. And also a personal, my brother Pawan Ingde is here, who has also traveled with me uh, from his there. He's uh, doing recording, as every loyal brother would do. <laughs> <laughs> so this is part of two events. One is in Nagpur, and one is in Brahmapuri. And the reason I was so excited about Brahmapuri, not that I was not excited about Nagpur, but Brahmapuri is because we don't really go to those places. And it is our responsibility to reach out to those unknown yet very important places. It is from there we can drive more inspiration and we can create more stars from the community. Sujata Saunik, who is now additional chief secretary to the government of Maharashtra. And Mani, who is another a bureaucrat. These are the people who have achieved something certain in their life, but they have not stopped there because that is a message to you all. Don't limit yourself with what you have received in an immediate gratification. If you receive something and you're happy in that, that is to confine your more talents. We want you to be the next Ivy League graduates. Because it is you who in the 21st century will be able to defend as well as fight against any atrocities or any violence that the community will receive from the bigot minds, Brahminical people. If you are sharp and if you are educated, and you know, education, of course, from Ivy League will grant you certain recognition because the people who harass us have also gone to those schools. They are part of the policies, they are part of the chief economic advisories, and they are consulting the governments on various levels. We can also be that, but we can also be pioneers in conducting independent research. 
We want pioneering researchers from our community, like the Jews did. Jews is a minority community if you consider them in, in a global ranking. But Jew is the only community that has highest number of Nobel Prize winners. We want our community to be the next highest Nobel Prize winning community. And it is through the foreign education. It is not necessarily that you will go to some cheap university here and you will get. Your education is not granting you curiosity, creativity. It is confining you. It is killing your desires and it is killing your every passionate attentions that you want. It is not encouraging research. It is not pushing you onto the edge. It is just giving you a paper granting you as an engineer, you as a doctor. You are not doing anything more. You are rote learning. You are mugging up your answers. You are sitting it for three hours, passing exam and getting a degree. You are not contributing to the knowledge production. I want us to be the knowledge producers. Without Producing knowledge, you will never own a knowledge. If you own knowledge, you will decide the discourse. And if you decide the discourse, you will set a new direction for the community and for the humanity as a whole. We need to understand this fundamental difference. Your education with a certificate would not mean as important if you do a classic research, a pioneering research, by contributing your research for the upliftment of entire hum humanity. It could be any discipline, it could be law, it could be engineering, it could be science, anything. It could be design, it could be arts. Let us not limit ourselves to what these educational mafias have given us. They have given us very limited options. They are not asking us to think beyond because they don't want you to expand. They know you are highly talented. How? Because in one generation, you can change the course of thousand years of slavery. Just one generation. Now imagine if the same amount of dedication and education is given with a highly sophisticated model. You will be the next Einstein of this country. And they don't want you to be that. We want you to be that. And our freedoms will come in various directions. Education is one of them. Uh, uh, Vijay Bhav was telling that education is our movement. Brother, we also want to make foreign education as a mass movement. <laughs> Until and unless we grapple with those issues. And what this is going to do is, this is going to expand our thinking. Current education system is Brahminical. You don't question your teachers. If you question, he or she will punish you in your viva. We are all victims of that. We all know that. What to do with these dronacharyas that are operating amongst us? We don't want to be the eklavyas. We want to become the next Baba Sahibs. And why was Baba Sahib unique? Baba Sahib went to Ivy League school. The elite, the best school of the times, Columbia University. And who did he study with? That's more important. That is what we need to understand. The kind of exposure you will get there. The kind of new ideas that are developing there. That ideas are so necessary for the upliftment of our community. No other person will be able to uplift your community. It is only enlightened minds amongst you will be able to support that upliftment. And today, when we are looking across, we are developing, we are creating, and we are manufacturing a generation of frustrated youth. They are frustrated. There are no jobs. Labor Periodic Survey 2019 says 19% of people with graduate degrees are unemployed. Why? Because the education system here is privatized and the government that you are so much looking after is losing its essence. It is now privatized. Adani, in last one year, in last one year, he made a profit of 109% more. How is it possible in a country where people are still entering the manual scam in, in the manholes and coming out as dead body when one particular caste is becoming the richest? We will be unable to grapple these issues if we continue to live in a localized form of life. We need to globalize.
I always wonder, had Baba Sahib not been exposed to this global knowledge, the global motifs, the international thinking, the broad horizon he was exposed to, be it in London or be it in America, two epicenters of modern educations, what would he have been? Would he have dealt with the Enlightenment era thinking? Would he have dealt with the barrister degree that he had and brought new dimensions and breath fresh air into our constitution? Baba Sahib Ambedkar became inevitable for this country. You couldn't even take the country's wheel an inch forward without Baba Sahib Ambedkar's interventions. And this is a responsibility upon us. How many of you call yourself Ambedkarites here? How many of you have decided to follow his path? How many of you went to Columbia University? <laughs> One. To study? Right. Pre presenting paper is a good thing, but did you study there? Did you have a degree there? We want that. Because being Ambedkar is just not mean to be having a fanciful interaction. If you are not highly educated as Baba Sahib, don't claim your Ambedkarateness as proudly. There is no worth that you are bringing to the community. You are just trying to make yourself pompous and proud among the semi literate people that you are hanging out with. Motha Panacha Shuat Tumala Dusraka Vitat Naya. Choti Nokri Malalila Sarkari. Adhikari Zale, Kitachatas to me Kushat. Ani Jok Samazatla Zo Gariburga, Tela to me Damnata Pretna Karta. Karan to me Motha Ambedkarata. These shameless people who operate amongst us and trying to tell their more Ambedkaritness have not even read Ambedkarite's entire thesis. And if we need to take Baba Sahib Ambedkar, uh, his mission forward, I think it's very important that we follow what he did in his life. And 100 years later, we need to do more than that. Perhaps we need to change some of that. Perhaps we need to advance some of that. But it is upon our responsibility, it is upon us to take this forward. How come does a minority community continue to dominate the economic means of production in this country while the other remains on the pittance of this minority community? Jains, for example. Do we not ask these important questions? Why is it that in international researches, where are our people? If you are a person who is working, congratulations. But we would also like you to do more than that. We would like you to contribute to the knowledge production. We don't want to be the consumers of knowledge. Because a customer has no much dignity. And for you to advance a step further, you need to own up to the principles of knowledge. And we need to principally understand what is production of knowledge mean. Production of knowledge means that you do adequate research, adequate investment, and you think about it by taking all the perspectives in mind. We have many knowledge producers amongst us without degrees. We are highly talented community. We are extremely sharp. We are extremely hardworking. If we have the same opportunities as other people, we will scale many heights. It's due to the economic, social, and as well as cultural disadvantages, we are unable to go to that side. It is upon our responsibility now. We were trying to give you that. And special uh, congratulations to uh, the parents. Because you have to now think actively about your children. Money is always going to be a problem. People come and tell me that they would like to um, uh, send their children to foreign education, but they have a money problem. Well, even if you have to send your children to a next city, money is still a problem. Money problem is always going to be there. We need to find out ways and pathways through this. If 100 students from our community, let's say, gets into Ivy League, I'm very sure our community will do fundraising to send those 100 kids to Ivy League schools. It's, it's possible. Let's not find excuses. Let's get into the best and then say, I was there, I had no money. We will make sure. Because we are proud of our achievers. We want new icons. These are our new icons.
and it is upon them and it is up to them that we are looking at. We are following their pathways. We need to create million and million of such icons amongst us. There was a time where if you had, if you're a clerk in a bank or clerk in office, you're like the best, you're like the most educated or the most reputed person in the community. Now who asks for a clerk? Things have changed. Things have changed, time has changed. And there was a time when you were a bureaucrat, when you were in the elite services. Now that is also changing. Because new avenues are being exposed to us. Initially we were confined, we were given a limited knowledge only and we were given limited futures only. And because of that we could not do more than what we deserve. Utilize this opportunity, be the pioneers. We don't have many pioneers in the community. This is a golden opportunity for you to be the pioneer of your own field. Don't just be the first in your family, be the first in the community and first in the country.